I didn't have the mic on this morning. Is it on now? I'm on, okay. Nothing like sweating it out for an hour and find out nobody heard a thing you said. Okay. There's an old man over in the nursing home in Orlando that I go see. He doesn't come to church, cannot come to church. He's, um, he's what you call shell-shocked. He's uh, got a good memory about some things, particularly World War II. So I was talking to him one time, and I said, uh, Brother Brenner, tell me about what happened. He said, well, I was a point man on a scout team, and he said, them, them Germans started shooting us up pretty bad. And he said, I don't know what happened to me, but I've been this way ever since. Now, his nerves shot to hell. I mean, he, he isn't worth two cents. He can't feed himself. He's spastic. But he said, uh, left me this way. Well, you, you got you to gotta, you gotta feel sorry for a guy like that. And every time I go to the nursing home, I try to remind the nurses that he's a war hero. Take good care of him. And they all say, oh, yeah, we know that. I said, well, then I'd like, I'd like to take good care of him. Just give his room a little more attention. Look after him because he's a war hero. And he is. Now, I don't know what you made out of, and I'm not so sure that most of us could have done any better than he did under the circumstances. But when you're, the, when you're the point man, you take a lot of heat, folks. Now, Peter Ruckman is the point man. And um, I don't know how, and I'm not saying because he's here, or I'm here in his place, but I don't know how, Peter Ruckman has been able to endure what he has endured. Now, I'm serious. And they've come after that guy with everything they had, and they still do. But he's not shell-shocked. He's still, still mean as ever, plowing right on ahead. I've never thought Dr. Ruckman was mean. I've told people, a thousand of them, people have talked to me, well, he's such a mean-spirited guy. I so said, you don't know him. If you, if you knew him, you wouldn't say that. But we ought to thank God for what he's done for this country. And you ought to get his books. I just read Biblical Scholarship the other day again. And uh, I said, man, I'll read this thing every year, a couple times a year. You ought to get his books and read them. You ought to have him sign him because he's going to be dead for long. And then, and then, everybody will love him. Isn't it sad? <laughs> Kick and cuss him every day of his life while he's alive, and as soon as he's dead, he's a great guy. My friend. <laughs> He was my friend. <laughs> now, there's some things that uh, we preachers can't... I'm not... I, 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 there's some things we can't compromise, folks. Um, oh, we, we, we have to stand firm on the deity of Christ. I had a young preacher over in Orlando. When I was a young preacher over in Orlando, uh, a good fellow came to see me, and he said, Now, we have a West Orange Ministerial Thanksgiving meeting every year, and we'd like you to be there, because the church was only one year old, and we had a thousand and one in Sunday school at our first anniversary. So he said, you're now the largest church. We need to be there. And I said, all right, I'd like to be there. Who's going to come? He said, well, we'll be having everybody, the Catholics, and everybody's coming, and, and the Lutherans, and the Presbyterians, and Methodists. And I said, uh, they all believe in the deity of Jesus? And he said, well, uh, well I don't know what they believe. He said, we don't... I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make up a statement, and you take it to each one, and if they all sign it, if they believe that he's virgin-born, lived a sinless life, died a, a, a sacrificial death on the cross, and was buried, and three days later, he got out of the grave, literally, bodily, 
physically and went to heaven with a new and glorified body, and he's coming back again. If, you'll, if they'll all sign that, I'll come. He said, you know they're not going to do that. I said, then you know I'm not going to be there. Now, I can't, I can't, I really cannot uh, sit with men that, that uh, don't believe that. Do, and, and if I have any testimony in the community, folks go to sit where you're sitting and look up there. Well, I mean, tonight, you're sitting there saying, well, he must agree with Dr. Ruckman. Because, of the, because I'm here. You're going to go away and somebody's going to say, you ever met Brother Ware years ago? Well, yeah, he's a, he's a Bible believer. How do you know that I'm a... Well, he, pro, he preached at one of our conferences. It's an association, you see. And by the way, if you think that being a Bible believer won't cost you, I, I'll assure you that it will cost you. You just try. And uh, the invitations diminish. Now, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is God in flesh, and the Word became flesh. And I believe that Jesus Christ is God wrapped up in human flesh. And I believe that. I believe man saved by grace, through faith. I believe that God loves sinners, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved, through faith. He says, it's not of yourselves a gift of God. He says, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I, pre I preach that, and I believe that. I believe that if a man believes, he's saved. And the reason folks aren't saved is because they don't believe. He that believes on him, he's not condemned, but he that believes not, he's condemned already. Because he has not believed. Now, folks, if that man you work with or live next to or live with or whatever, if he really believed that he'd die and go to hell forever, he'd get saved. He don't believe that. He might say, I believe in hell, but he doesn't believe in hell. The reason he doesn't get saved is because he doesn't believe. Now I'll tell you something else. If a man believed that he could be saved by believing on Jesus, he'd get saved. You don't get saved because he doesn't believe that. He thinks there's something else to it. But the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. Now I believe that. And I may not agree with everything that everybody who saved does, but I believe that everybody who believes is born again. Furthermore, I believe that everybody who saved is saved the moment he believes. And I think that every man who saved the moment he saved is saved for eternity. That simply means that when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have given to you as a gift of God eternal life. That is, that's life without end. And it happens the moment you believe on Jesus Christ. Now, I think that's what the Bible teaches. Now, if a man says, I don't believe you're saved forever, if you'll show me a sin that a man can commit, I'll show you a man in the Bible who did it. A fellow said to me one time, well, you never know. He said, I know a fellow one time, he tried to peddle his wife. I said, sounds just like Abraham to me. He said, that guy's a con artist. I said, I know, just like Jacob. He said, that man that killed a man, I know, just like Moses. He's an adulterer, just like David. This fellow's got a filthy mouth, just like Peter. He quit the Lord, just like Mark. You see, every argument you can come up with we can give you a Bible answer why it's not so. 
Now, I don't have anything to do with what I want to preach about tonight. I just, I just wrote that down sitting over there in a the pew. Just trying to figure out how I could eat up some time so Brother Kapazinski doesn't get it all. You don't need to hear him. You'll hear him tonight. You need to hear Brother Stevens. I call him a brood mare. That guy can give more milk from the Word of God than anybody I ever. He's twist. I'm not sure it's all theologically sound, but it sounds good. <laughs> and the sermon I'd laid out for tonight, I don't have. I didn't even bring it from the hotel. I thought I'd just read a chapter. So find the book of 1 Kings chapter 13. You see, it sort of says something that we preachers need to hear. The Bible says there was a man of God. Now, I preached on the man of God this morning. I preached on I'm a preacher. That's all I can do, to be honest with you. I don't do a very good job at it. I can't drive nails, and I can't saw boards, and I can't fix anything. I don't want to learn to fix anything either, actually. People find out you can do that, they'll... So I just, I just tell everybody, all I can do is talk. If you want me to preach, sit down, I'll do that, but I can't fix anything. The Bible says there's a man of God out of Judah. There aren't many men of God. Oh, no, there's not. I'd say that the vast majority of preachers are not men of God. I didn't say they weren't saved. I said the vast majority of preachers are not men of God. They are what you might call men of the church. And they're good mixers. Cocktails, whatever. They're good mixers. They, they are trained to be that way. They're not men of God. They're men of the church. They know how to get along with just anybody. Now, I have a son. I have two sons. One of my boys, God bless him, he's a very brilliant kid. He's, he's just like his mother. And uh, he's, he's an attorney. He and the former governor of the state of South Carolina have a law firm. And, uh, and he, makes, he makes tons of money. And... Uh, Ethan's a good man, but he joined the Southern Baptist Church. He said, Dad, now he said, Dad, I've tried every church. He said, I'm telling you, I even went to a black church. He said, there just aren't any independent churches in Winsboro, North, uh, South Carolina, which is considerably north of Columbia. I said, well, you drive to Columbia to your law office every day. You could drive. So well, my wife and kids can't get there. And, you know, I practice all across America and he gave me the typical arguments. And I said, well, I can't tell you what to do. You're a grown man. Called me one day. He said, now, Dad, he said, I've had about all I can take. He said, we had a revival meeting this week. Baptist Church of Winsboro. I said, how'd it go? Anybody saved? He said, I'll tell you what we had. We had a woman preacher. I said, you deserve it. And he said, Dad, she didn't give any invitations till the last night. And on the closing night of the crusade, she said, I want everybody that'll promise to do better to take a rose. We all, we all sat in church holding our rose. <laughs> I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life. I said, well, if you're going to be there, you've got to put up with it. Called me a little while later, a few weeks later. Dad, he said, i got another problem over the church. I said, what happened? Well, he said, I decided to go so in. I took eight young boys to church with me. And the board asked for a meeting. And it told me, Mr. Ware, he said, they said, this is the first Baptist church. That ain't our type. 
I said, well, you're getting exactly what you deserve. But he stayed. He said, what am I going to do, Dad? Got no church for my wife and kids. He called me a few weeks later. He said, now, Dad, I've done had all I can take. I said, what happened? He said, it's Easter Sunday, you know. He said, preacher got up today and he said, he is going to preach on Easter. But he said, he told everybody, now, I want you all to know, First Baptist Church, Winsboro, South Carolina. He said, I want you all to know I don't believe in the resurrection. He said, Dad, I, I don't think I can go back. I said, good. So he sold his house. That was a big two-story southern home, the old, old home. Sold it and moved into an apartment in Columbia so he'd have a church to go to. Now, I just said that to say, not to brag so much on Ethan, though I'd like to. I just said that to say... There are not many men of God out there. There are some, but not many. There are men of the church, and there are men of the denomination, and there are men who are social workers and nothing more, and they occupy the pulpits, but they're not men of God. I should hope that all of you who are here tonight would think of yourselves as men of God. The Bible says this man of God was in Judah, and it was by the word of the Lord that he went to Bethel and Jeroboam. Stood by the altar. This is a pagan man at a, at a pagan altar. And he's getting ready to burn incense. Now, folks, you may not, you may not realize what, what damage an, what an idol or an altar to an idol can do. I lived over in India for a couple of years. And I'll tell you something. That place is given over wholly to idolatry. The Indians claim they have 320 million. I didn't misquote it. They claim they have 320 million gods and goddesses. They worship everything. They worship the sun, the moon, the stars, rats. they got a rat temple. You ever seen that on TV? You ought to see it. I mean, just millions of rats. And they just run all over the temple. And the priest goes in every night and feeds those stupid rats. And then they have monkey gods. They have elephant gods. They have snake gods. They have every kind of 320. How can I name them? 320 million. He said, well, that's just ignorance on their part. It's worse than ignorant. You see, right across from the hotel, I usually stay in. Dr. Ruckman mentioned the city, the Hyderabad, this morning. Right across from the uh, hotels uh, where I usually stay, not where we stay, Doc, but where I stay, it's, it's uh, on the Secundabad side, but right across is a theater. And I was there when that movie house opened. And there's a big row about it. And I'll tell you what the man did that owns that movie house. He has a God, and his God demands a human sacrifice. He killed a little Indian boy and shed his blood, sprinkled his blood all over the outside of that stupid movie house. Now, they caught him. I don't know what they did to him. Probably got six, eight months in jail for that. But you see, that's idolatry for you. You drive through Bombay, 10,000 little girls, 10,000 of them in the red light district, the largest red light district in the world is in Bombay, India. 10,000 of them. Most of them 10, 12, 14 years old. He said, well, I guess they're prostituting themselves to get some money, to get some food. The sad commentary is, you listen to me, most of them were given by their parents as a sacrifice to the love God of India. They'll stay there till they die from some horrible disease. Don't talk to me about it. it's just a matter of ignorance. Throw this pulpit at you. 
I tell you, boy, it kind of makes you mad when you think about it. Better get off that India thing. Just to say that idolatry... You see, when people talk about India, they, they say, well, you know how third world countries are. I said, no, India is different from any other place in the world. It's different. No place like it. Because it's given to idolatry. When a people are given to idolatry, you see, you cannot have a democracy, you cannot have a republic, you cannot have sanity when you worship 320 different million gods and goddesses. Now, what do you do when you get in a moral dilemma? Call Dr. Laura, of course. When I have a moral dilemma, I read the Bible. And if I can't find it, thus saith the Lord exactly, I say, I wonder what Jesus would do. Then if I start saying, Miguel, well, yeah, he was God, that's not fair. Then I say, what would Paul do? He's an example. Now, Indians no different than you and I. When he gets in a moral dilemma, what does he do? He picks up the Gita. And the Gita says, this God is having an affair with this goddess down on the next level. And this God is having a homosexual relation with this young boy that he went down to India and picked up and took back to heaven with him. And this God stole some gold from this God on the other side. These are the gods and the goddesses of India. Now, when you turn to the Bible and the Word of God says, Thou shalt not, you say, I can't do that. It's again the Word of God. Well, when an Indian picks up the Gita and it says it's okay to be homosexual, it's okay to be adulterous, it's okay to commit murder, it's okay to offer human sacrifices, my God, what do you expect them to do? Well, I'm just simply saying that idolatry runs deeper than you might realize. The truth is, the culture of India, the, and I didn't mean to talk about India, but the culture of India is nothing more than the fruit of idolatry. And I'm ready to debate that with just about anybody, with anybody. Well, this man was a man of God, and he went up and here Jeroboam was, set up his own little church. Didn't want to stand by the Word of God, and this young man cried against the altar of the the Bible says he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and he said, Altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, a child should be born named Josiah. You know the story. He goes on to talk about the judgment that's going to be taking place around this altar. The Bible says in verse number 3, he gave a sign that same day. He said, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. It's always mighty good to preach that way, you know. The Lord said, Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when the king heard somebody talking against his religion. No, he's not a Christian. Criticize somebody else's religion. King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, cried against the altar of Bethel. The Bible says he put forth his hand. And he said, lay hold on him. Get, get, get that Ruckmanite. And put forth against him. They, uh, they, they put, he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in. So here's the king, Jeroboam. He reaches out to grab the man of God. And he can't get his arm back. God paralyzed his arm. He said, do you think God still does that stuff? Well, the Bible says, lay hold on him, and his hand which he put forth dried up. But the, the altar was rent, the ashes were poured out, and the king said to the man of God, Treat the face of the Lord and pray for me, that my hand may be restored again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored. The king said to the young boy, he said, Now, son, he said, I want you to come over to the house. King James Bible, verse 7, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I'll give you a reward. You better watch it. You better watch it. 
There are a lot of folks out there that want to give you something. But you just remember this. When a man gives you something, he's expecting something. Man of God said unto the king, If thou give me half of your house, I'll not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. It was so charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and turned not by the way that he came to Bethel. That sounds like a simple enough story, doesn't it? God said to a guy, a young preacher, he said, Son, go over there and bring a curse against that altar. He goes over and does it. And some potentate says, You're not going to get away with that. And he lashes out against him. And God throws his arm. The young man prayed for him. He got his arm back. He said, Now, son, I appreciate your help, and I begin to understand a little bit of what you're doing. I want you to come on over to the house. Now, that boy could have, he could have justified, he could have justified. Well, I got a chance to witness to it now. But you better watch it. Next verse said, There dwelt, and this, I wish this story stopped at verse 10. But it don't stop there. The Bible says, Now there dwelt a prophet in Bethel, and his sons came home and told him the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. This old prophet that I just mentioned, he was a prophet of God. Now I'm sure if you sat down and talked to him, he'd said, I love the Lord God of Israel. He's called a prophet of God. I have no reason to challenge that. The Bible says, as soon as the son said, Dad, you really would have been impressed because there's one guy over there who talks just about like you, and uh, they recap the story that I just gave you. I'm, I'm struggling whether to tell you a story or not. Well, I don't know, maybe later. But it fits right back there where I left. One time a fellow called me. I'm going to tell it on him. One time a preacher called me one morning and said, Dr. Ware, he said, I, have, I need to talk to you and apologize to you for something. And I said, all right. He said, I was in a group of preachers the other day that really, really took you apart. And I said, oh, well, I said, all right, don't worry about it. He said, no, it's, he said, I, I, don't, I don't think God's pleased with what I said or what I listened to. And he said, I, I just wanted to call you and tell you that there's five of us, and we just said the most awful things about you. And he said, now, I'm, I'm going to contact all of these other brothers, and I'm going to tell them that I'm sorry. And he said, um, actually, he said the man that was do, doing most of the talking was a man, a former member of your church. So always goes that way, doesn't he? He said he, is a mem- he, was, a, he was a missionary with, with youth, not Youth for Christ, but uh, Jack Wertson's ministry. And he said, you know... And you, you all had to get rid of him for some reason, and he's, uh, he's really bitter. And I said, well, that's all right. Don't worry about it. He said, no, he said some bad things. He said, he saw you in a compromising position with a woman. Well, now that got to me. I mean, that, hit, that hit the wrong button, or the right button. I picked up the phone, I called that missionary, and I said, now, I said, now, fella... Now, I'm going to tell you what I said to him. I'm not necess- I don't think God's pleased with what I said to him. And I'm, I'm serious. I think God wrote a black mark by my name that morning. I called him up and I said, Dwayne, I said, Dwayne, I was just told. He was real quiet on the other end. And I said, there's five people in that group. You're the, you're the king leader. You told them that you saw me in a company. That's a lie. And I said, now, I've got a three-day meeting somewhere. I don't remember where it was. And I'm catching an aircraft out this afternoon. I'll be back in Saturday. And I said, now, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pull you out in the front yard, and I'm going to beat you to a bloody pup right in front of your wife and kids. Now, Jesus wouldn't have done that. And by the way, he did it. However, he 
He was about 37 or 8 years old. However, about a week later, he got sick. Somebody called me and said, he's sick, you ought to pray for him. I said, I will. And I did. And I asked the church to pray for him. Somebody called me and said, he's really sick. And I said, well, we're praying for him. They said, you think you ought to go see him? I said, that'd probably kill him. So I don't think I better go, but I'll pray for him. Next day he called me and said he died. Not sick. He just died. Did I think God killed him? I didn't. You better watch out when you raise your hand against the man of God. You better watch out. And that's not the only story I could tell, and you've probably got plenty of your own. I'm just simply saying that God takes care of His own. This old preacher, and they're the worst kind, by the way, the old kind. I mean, when you're young, you got it. I mean, you want to fight. You want to, you want to, you want to go out there and conquer. You want to build. You want to rise. You're struggling. When you get old, you get soft like me. And you get compromising like Ruckman. And you start wanting to pussyfoot around a little bit. The Bible said this, this father, this old prophet, this old retired minister said, which way did he go? said, uh, sons had seen which way he went. So the Bible said his son said, he said to his son, saddle me the ass. So here's one ass on top of another headed out after the preacher of God. They went after the man of God and they found him sitting under a tree. He asked him, are you the man of God? He said, I am. He said, I want you to come home with me and eat bread. He said, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee, neither will I eat bread or drink water with thee in this place. I can't do it. He said, in verse number 17, it was said to me by the word of the Lord. He said, it's against the Bible. He said, it's against the word of God. Fellas, all you got is the word of God. You better study it. You better memorize it. And when you stand up for God's sake, preach it. Don't you be afraid when you stand up and say, God said. Well, he said, I can't. He said, God told me I can't. He said, if I, if I go back, I'll be violating the Word of God. I'm not to eat any bread, drink no water. I can't go back the way that I came. So I can't go. The old man said, well, now, wait just a minute. He said, before I came over here, I was praying, and an angel spoke to me. Better watch them angels. Truthfully, you wouldn't know one if you met one, would you? And Paul said in Galatians, if an angel comes down from heaven, let him go to hell if he's preaching something else. You know, I used to be on television Saturday and Sunday. We had the phone lines man, so prayer requests would come in. And uh, one day, I thought I'd go. I'd never done it, but the people used to tell me, "says great fun, you ought to try." No, oh, yo, yeah, one of these days I will. No, on Saturday, I was thinking it was a Saturday. I went over there, and the phone lines started lighting up. Of course, telecast was done on tape. And the phone lines lit up. Calls started coming. Half a dozen folks answered. And I picked up the phone. The lady said, said, I didn't tell her who I was. She just said, uh, I need prayer. And I said, all right, what do we need to pray about? She said, the demons. I said, demons? What kind of demons? She said, uh, my car had a flat tire this morning. She said, I know a demon did that. And I said, lady, you ever thought about maybe a nail went into it? <laughs> oh, no, she said, it's a demon. I mean, Christians are about half nuts. <laughs> this happened yesterday, day before yesterday. Yesterday, I'm on the way up here, and I stopped to see a man I've known for many years. And his wife said to me, she said, oh, I'm so glad you came. i got a question to ask you. 
This happened just yesterday, the night before. I said, what is it? She said, you know, the other day, I woke up about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I couldn't go back to sleep. And I told a young preacher about it, and he said that was God. And he said, any time you wake up in the middle of the night, it's God. And she said, I didn't pray. Has it ever happened to you? I said, every morning at 2 o'clock, but I have to go to the bathroom. I answered another phone or two. I finally quit. Because all the people calling in are those crazy charismatics. And every one of them has a demon. I mean, I got the demon of smoking. I got the demon of anger. I finally said to the folks in there, y'all tell it, I don't want more to do with it. I couldn't be nice to them. Well, anyway, he said, I can't go back. The old man said, well, son, I want to talk to you a few minutes. He said, now, I've been in the ministry a long time. Now, you're just getting started. You listening to me? And he said, uh, I know you just graduated and all of that, and this is your first assignment, but he said, he said, I've, I've got some things I need to share with you. He said, you come on. I said, well, I can't. He said, no, that's okay. God told me. Send an angel down to tell me. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you something. Paul said, if another, if an angel comes and gives you a different gospel, let him be damned. Don't you, listen, don't you be intimidated by old preachers and big preachers and rich preachers and popular preachers and powerful preachers. You stand by the book. If you can't, get out of the ministry. Go out. Go out and make an honest living. Said. Well, the Bible says, and he used a word that you wouldn't want to use as a minister of the gospel. The Bible says, but he lied. Now, the Bible says he went back with him. Sad story, isn't it? While he was at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet. They brought him back. He cried to the man of God. He said, Son... The Lord God, the Lord, for as much said as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and had not kept the commandments which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but you came back, and you ate bread, and you drank water in this place, by which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water, thy carcass shall not come to the sepulcher of thy fathers. That's about as heavy a handed curse that you could put on a Jew boy. You can't be buried in a home. You've got to be buried in a faraway place. And the Bible said, after he'd eaten drunk, he saddled the ass for him, and sent him on his way, and a lion, a lion met him. And the Bible says, a lion met him by the way and killed him, slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the lion stood by the carcass. The men that passed by, they saw it, realized who it was, and they told in the city, and the old prophet, the Bible says, where he dwelt. He said, it's the man of God who was disobedient to the word of God, the word of the Lord. And the Lord hath delivered him to the lion, slain him according to the word of the Lord. He went out and found his carcass by the way, put on the ass. And then the Bible says, it came back to the city, and he took him up, took the carcass up, where he brought it back, and mourned over him, and buried him in his own grave in Samaria. He said to his boys, Now, sons, when I die, bury me in the sepulcher where the man of God is buried. Now, I want you to know something. I gave you a whole story just to say that your ministry and my ministry is to be based upon what God says in His Word. And that's it. And it doesn't matter who tries to get you to do something different. And then you shouldn't let it, 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 regardless of how enticing it might appear, regardless of what assurances you might receive, if you'll only, I'm telling you, if God takes His hand off of you, 
there's a serious price to pay. I pray you'll just stand by the book. Thank you, God. All right. Now, this is good words of wisdom here. Uh, this thing here, the, the type here is, you go up to school, there's a faculty member there, a professor. He's about uh, 60, 70 years old, and you can trust him. And he'll take your final authority away from you in less than a week. Put a doubt in your mind about that Bible. And he'll say, well, God spoke to me through. Yeah, God did. God's going to use him to test you. God used a fellow like that to test you through the Word of God or not. You went back in the book of Numbers. The fellow goes to sleep one night, and uh, he's got some messengers come to him. They say, if you come over here with this king, he'll give you anything you want, a blank check. And all you got to do is come with me and curse Israel. The fellow goes to bed that night, and the Lord comes to him at night and says, one, uh, don't go with, the, with these fellows here. Don't curse the people. You can't curse them. They're blessed. Three-point message. One, don't go. Two, don't curse them. Three, they're blessed. You get up next morning, they say, what did the Lord say? And he says, the Lord refused me to let me go. That isn't what he said. He said, don't go. Don't curse them. They're blessed. He gave one point of three points. That's what Billy Graham does. It isn't what he says that's so, so bad. It's what he doesn't say. That's what's wrong. Now, when Schofield hit that note, the Schofield Bible, the Schofield Note Bible is the best reference Bible you can get. I don't go back on that. But Schofield would have his days. He'd have his days when he wanted to impress somebody. So he said that Balaam, when Balaam got up and went, you know, that, uh, that was uh, the permissive will of God. It wasn't. Next time those fellows came back, they said, Come on, let nothing stop you from coming. He said, I can't go beyond the Word of God to do more or less than God said. The very rascal always cut the message in two-thirds when he said that. When he said, I'm going to say just what God told me to say, he lied. He only told him a third of it. And the Lord came to Balaam and said, If the men call thee to go with them, get up and go, if they call you. And the next morning he got up and they didn't call him. Now, Schofield's a good man. But see, he couldn't get the greatest chapter in the Bible on a preacher being obedient to what God told him to say. And so that was permissive will of God. It wasn't the permissive will of God. It wasn't the permissive or the direct disobedience to the Word. And the moral of that is, don't, I don't like, he said, he told you. He told you. He's hungry, godly, and all of joy. The Word first. The Word first. Amen. All right.